the standard model of particle physics is one of the most revolutionary theories humans have ever created. It underpins most of the fundamental interactions and particles of reality. It has allowed us to predict particles like the top quark and the Higgs boson long before they were discovered. I'm Dr. Alfredo Carpinetti from IFL Science, and to mark the International Year of Quantum Science and Technology, we travel to CERN to talk with Professor Urs Widerman about this wildly important theory and what lies beyond it. Most generally speaking, the standard model is the model that encompasses all we know about the microscopic world on the level of, of single particles. So everything we know fits into this standard model and this standard model can be written actually in a form that it fits on a t-shirt. So it's, it's a very compressed way of formulating knowledge that starts with say Maxwell and Einstein and goes up to the uh, great theoretical discoveries and experimental verifications of the 20th and 21st century. All of particle physics rests on this incredible theory, but there are some obvious limitations that need to be addressed. All theories discovered by humankind are theories with limitations. So the very fact that also the most encompassing, the most complete theory found today has limitations Realizing that the theory has limitations is always a first step to learning about what comes beyond, what is an even better theory. So if you go back in the history of physics, you have, for instance, electromagnetism and the beautiful theory of Maxwell. It's not that this theory is wrong. This theory has limitations. It doesn't explain everything we see. One understood step by step these limitations. It's a theory that is now embedded in a bigger theory. It can be understood as being embedded in the standard model. The same for the nuclear forces that keep together the nucleons in a nucleus, so in a lead nucleus. Um, the same for the electroweak forces. Each of these theories has intrinsic limitations and by thinking about the limitations, and how one could test them experimentally, um, how one could see what is behind experimentally, how one could see the little cracks in an almost complete theory. That's a way to, to learn about the theory that lies behind. The indication that the standard model is limited comes from many sources. Studying the universe, for example, has revealed there could be particles and forms of energy that cannot be explained by the standard model alone? Well, first of all, we have observations by now, not in the laboratory, but from uh, cosmology, from um, astrophysics, that cannot be understood with the standard particle content. And the question then for particle physics is, if I see something that there is more, what is the microscopic structure? How does that interact with uh, the rest of my world? That is in particular the so-called dark matter. It's also on an even more complicated level what goes under dark energy. So in short, and that would be an entire lecture or course of lectures, in short, if we try to understand the measured expansion history of our universe, we are led to the conclusion that there is more matter than the matter than, that we observe, that there is more that exerts gravitational forces than what we understand within the standard model. We are in Yorkshire in the UK at the Bowlby Underground Laboratory to find out what is dark matter. Dark matter is the name that we've given to a phenomenon that we observe in the universe that, that helps create the structure of the universe. It's called matter because it has a pull of gravity. It's called dark matter because we can't see it. We see it in the large scale structure of the universe and variations in the cosmic microwave background 
all of these things can be described by the, the levels of mass that we see, and there is not nearly enough mass contained in stars, in dust, in gases, in planets to explain the effects that we see. A problem like dark matter is like solving a crime. There's candidates, there's suspects. Some have got better motivations than the others and it fits together better. So one of the most common suspects is a category of particle called WIMPs, which is a, a weakly interacting massive particle. This is a type of fundamental particle that would exist uh, in massive quantities in the universe, but it would not interact with the electromagnetic force. So it's dark, it's dark matter, and we literally can't see it because it doesn't interact with light, um, but it does still have mass. There are a few dark matter detectors running around the world. These particle detectors that are tailored to test this theory of is dark matter particles. There's a race on around the world to prove if this is true or not. And the question is, how does it interact with a standard model? There could be uh, some, some coupling to the particles that we produce in this lab. And if that were the case, we would finally, with the right accelerator, with the right experimental technique, be able to produce that dark matter. Or if we don't detect it, we would at least see that part of the energy that we produce goes into some, something unobserved that would be also an experimental signal. We call such signal missing energy signals. They are searched for wildly in, uh, in the accelerator here, so in the detectors. Another is about what we're made of, but we wouldn't know without particle physics. We are made of matter and not antimatter. But there is no reason why this should be the case in the standard model. While the theories we look at are largely symmetric, they make small distinctions between matter and antimatter, but these distinctions are not sufficient. So the distinctions made in the standard model, they are not sufficient to explain why there is so much more matter than antimatter in the universe. So that's one other source on the particle physics side that is looked into. We look in the elementary interactions for additional sources that produce more matter than antimatter. And of course, the big one for us is gravity. We experience gravity as the major fundamental force in our everyday life. From you tripping over to the planets orbiting the sun, we experience this force everywhere. However, gravity does not fit within the standard model. Gravitation is the weakest of all forces. So it becomes very important on large scales. It's clearly important for the fact that we sit here and not float around. But if I go to the question why this table is stable or why I keep together and I don't flow apart, gravitation plays a minor role on small scales it, it is not important. It's a, it's a much, much weaker force. That's the reason why most of the particle physics we do can get away without understanding gravitation at all. And that's also why the, the reason why it's so difficult to think about scenarios in which a possible quantum aspect of gravitation becomes relevant. So everyone says gravitation is a classical theory. You have hundreds of YouTube clips about that, certainly. And indeed, we understand gravity only on the classical level. And indeed, there is a big theoretical effort. Also, some of my colleagues involved here at CERN um, who try to think about particular scenarios Gedanken experiment is the nice German word for it. The scenarios in which one could at least theoretically understand the quantum nature of gravity. But that is at this moment in time not really a an, an research frontier that is already in contact with uh, experimental capabilities. Even if we see black holes in the universe and we see black hole mergers, even these mergers still send only signals to us at the moment that are of purely classical nature, that do not test any quantum character 
of gravitation. That's why it's so difficult to, to think in this direction. I think the, the main importance of gravitation and gravitational waves in particular in the last decade with the discovery of gravitational waves is, you see, when, when people in the 19th century discovered that light is an electromagnetic wave, it became a technique to see things that we would never have seen before. If you have nowadays a fractured bone or you think something is wrong, you have Röntgen. A technique enabled by that very discovery of Hertz. It was not only seeing and orienting ourselves with our human capabilities, with our human eyes. It was the ability to use that as a tool on all possible length scales. Just like the discovery of light beyond the visible has opened a new understanding of science, from the X-rays we use to see inside our bodies to the microwaves being used to study the beginning of the universe, so gravitational waves are also changing our understanding of physics. The fact that we now have discovered of the order 10 years ago gravitational waves means that we have now these waves step by step available to see something that we never saw before. So we learn, for instance, about how many black holes there are, or black hole mergers, simply because we see them via these gravitational waves. And we know that in the hot and dense early universe, there were time scales before which no light could escape anymore, because the early universe becomes opaque to light. However, with particle physics techniques here at CERN, we start learning something about the microscopic dynamics that took place in the early universe much before that epoch at which the universe became transparent. And with gravitational waves, we do the same. In principle, with gravitational waves, we can look back behind that curtain into the earlier times of the universe not with the gravitational waves measured now, but with the gravitational waves that are planned to be measured in the 2030s, 40s in future experiments. What I want to convey is there is even on that level a parallel between what we do here at CERN in the long-term future when we go beyond the standard model and what cosmologists, astrophysicists do when they try to, to look back in time. Thank you for joining us on this fascinating foray into the standard model and what might lie beyond this incredible theory. We will leave you with some final words from Professor Wiedermann. When I was young originally, I didn't consider studying physics because I thought it's a done science. I thought it's cool, I filled in the formulas, I got the right result. What is the point of doing that all lifelong? And then, relatively late at university, I appreciated that this is not the case and that it's a living science and that there is much that is still hidden from us and that every generation has a chance to get its share from that knowledge. So, if I would like to convey a message, then yes, it's a science that progresses on these huge timescales, 10, 50, 100 years but it's a very enriching and satisfactory science and uh, that there is place for many generations to work on it.